All right. Well, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce somebody who needs absolutely no introduction to, uh, to this uh, crowd, our very own Jim McGuire. Uh, I trust everybody knows him and knows about his research, so I'm going to try to say a few things that maybe you don't know about him. <laughs> don't worry, I, I won't say the, the bad stuff that Rory, Rory shared with me. I'll keep that all quiet. <laughs> uh, so, I, you know, and all of this is on his website, so it's actually not that secretive. Um, he got his undergraduate degree in business administration. How many people knew that? <laughs> All right. Some of you did. Well, maybe you should be handling the, the finances of this class. <laughs> uh, and then uh, he went on to do his uh, PhD at, at Austin. I think everybody probably knows this with uh, uh, Dave Canatella and David Hillis. Uh, he did a postdoc uh, at the Smithsonian with Kevin DeKiros. His first faculty position was at LSU uh, for a couple of years before coming here in 2003, uh, where he's been ever since, and we hope he stays forever. So uh, Now, Jim, is uh, he, he's published uh, a lot. He's well-funded. He's trained many uh, fantastic students. Uh, his research interests are incredibly uh, broad. Uh, so uh, everybody probably knows about his work on uh, gliding, on flying lizards, uh, his work on flight and hummingbirds, his work on uh, phylogeography, and uh, especially in Indonesia, he has a very active research program uh, uh, in Indonesia, and just more generally, his his work on in systematics. Uh, if you look on his uh, website, he says, uh, given that my own interests lie in phylogenetic systematics population genetics, biogeography, and comparative biology, which is pretty much all of biology as far as I'm concerned. He says, I anticipate that most students in my lab group will undertake research in one or some of these areas, but I'm willing to advise students working in other areas as well. So I, I guess that means like physics and chemistry and <laughs> business administration. Maybe I can change that. <laughs> sounds, sounds pretty good. So he's done a lot of field work, of course. I've never been into the field with him. Uh, it would be really fun to, although after reading what's on his website, I'm not so sure. He says, if you, this is now to prospective graduate students, if you do have a taste uh, for remote field camps, don't mind being stranded by the occasional rampaging river, like sharing the deck of your overnight ferry with the odd water buffalo, and can run faster than a tiger, <laughs> field work in Southeast Asia might be for you. <laughs> That sounds a lot more exciting than it really is. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I won't say any more so that uh, we can hear all the wonderful things uh, Jim has to tell us. Thank you very much for speaking. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, for those of you who heard me talk uh, a few years ago about this same system, uh, there's going to be some overlap. I apologize for that, but I think there are a fair number of people in the room who haven't heard me speak about flying lizards before. And I'll just tell the people who did hear me speak before, you might not remember that I didn't have genomics data the last time I spoke. So there is new data here, even if it seems a little bit familiar to you. So um, many of you know that I'm on sabbatical. <laughs> and I've had a few people ask me, why are you giving the MVZ lunch seminar while you're on sabbatical? <laughs> Normally, seminars are supposed to happen after your sabbatical. And so I have a subtitle for my talk, a report for Michael Dockett. <laughs> Michael twisted my arm into giving this talk. But, uh, but it's a great opportunity. I love talking about flying lizards in Sulawesi. And so, uh, so thanks for giving me the yeah. opportunity to talk about this system again. Looking forward to the report. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a project that's it's near and dear to my heart. It's, uh, it's so near and dear to my heart that I can't stop working on it. Um, and I can't finish it. That seems to be my biggest problem. And any project that's been going on for a long time, and this project's been going on for more than a decade, uh, always involves a lot of collaborators. And these aren't all of my collaborators on this project, but these are people who have played really key roles. And so if you see your picture there, that's great. If you don't see your picture there, I apologize for, for getting you. But lots of people have been involved in this research. It's definitely not just me. So the, the, uh, the island that I'm going to talk about today is Sulawesi. Uh, and, you know, I imagine that, you know, people who've heard me speak before, they, you know all about Sulawesi, but if you haven't heard me speak before, you may not know anything about this island. You may not know where it is or how big it is or why somebody would be interested in studying the, you know, the biology of the, of the biota of that island. Uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about the island uh, to, to get started. So Sulawesi is in Southeast Asia. This is Sulawesi here in black. It sits immediately to the east of Borneo, a little west of New Guinea, Australia, a little south of the Philippines, north of the Lesser Sundas. 
So it's sitting within this realm called Wallacea. The island is, it's a tropical island, not surprisingly. So it straddles the equator and it resides between two degrees north latitude and six degrees south latitude. So it's sitting right on the equator, very tropical place. The island is huge. I often ask people who you know, I meet for the first time, you know, like in my office, if they know what can they tell me about Sulawesi, you know, how big do they think it is if I show them, a picture of them, show them a picture of the island on a map. And people invariably think the island is smaller than it really is. It's the 11th largest island in the world. Its uh, <coughs> area is 177,600 square kilometers. So it's larger than Java. I mean, Java has 150 million people living on it. And this island's larger than that one. There are only 17 million people living on Sulawesi, but the fact that there are 17 million people there, I think, provides a pretty good indication of how big this island is. This isn't one of the Channel Islands. This is basically like a small continent. Uh, and the island has tremendous topographical relief. So there are vast areas of the island that are over 1,000 meters in elevation. There are 20 summits on the island that are 2,500 meters or higher, and there are six summits that are over 3,000 meters culminating in the largest mountain on the island, uh, Gunung, Ratamar uh, Gunung Ratamario, which is 3,478 meters high. So that's a big mountain. We went to that mountain last year doing some of our ongoing biotic survey work. So all of this topography provides opportunity for substantial diversification on the island, and the elevational diversification hasn't really been very well explored yet. And this talk today is not going to be about that. So Sulawesi is, sits within Malaysia, as I mentioned before. It's separated from Borneo by the Makassar Strait, and the Makassar Strait is where Wallace's line resides. So this is, our, this is Wallace's line. This is Lydecker's line over here. These two biogeographical boundary lines uh, demarcate continental shelves. So Borneo sits on the Greater Sunda Shelf, as does Java, as does Sumatra and the Malay Peninsula. And during periods of, uh, of of uh, lower sea level during glacial maxima, even as recently as 10 or 12,000 years ago, all of these land areas become united into a single land area, Sunda land. Uh, but the Makassar Strait is thousands of meters deep. It never is, uh, becomes land positive, so Sulawesi is always isolated. And so the Wallace line running between Borneo and Sulawesi reflects this deep, uh, this deep channel. And the same thing happens over here with the Sabul Shelf and Lydecker's line where New Guinea and Australia become united. But the islands in the middle in Wallacea uh, never become united with these, uh, with these adjacent continental land masses. So the fact that the island's never been connected to the mainland is responsible for, you know, for the island not having a very rich uh, fauna. It's got a very depauperate fauna, as it turns out, because the Wallace's <coughs> line in Makassar Strait represents a really effective filter barrier uh, that prevents diversity from the adjacent Sunda shelf from making the jump onto Sulawesi. And you can show this with virtually any taxon or any group uh, I'm showing you an example with reptiles and amphibians. So with reptiles and amphibians, there are 79 genera that are found on Borneo that haven't made it to Sulawesi. And in fact, the entire Sulawesi fauna is only 67 genera, and almost all of those genera are found on Borneo. So Sulawesi has less than half of the generic diversity that's present on adjacent Borneo, which is a testament to the fact that this, this, uh, this narrow strait between the two <laughs> islands has been a very effective filter barrier for a lot of diversity. And these are not species, these are genera. We're talking about huge assemblages of species in many cases, none of which has made it to Sulawesi and is represented there. So my, my hero, Alfred Russell Wallace, has this amazing quote from uh, Island Life. And you know, he was uh, one of the founding fathers of biogeography. He knew something about the biogeography of every island in the world, essentially. And he made the argument that there's no other example on the globe of an island so closely surrounded by other islands on every side yet preserving such a marked individuality in its forms of life. So he was noting that the fauna of Sulawesi is very high in endemism. So this filter barrier has <laughs> prevented a lot of lineages from getting there, but the ones that have got there tend to be endemics. Virtually everything out there is, is endemic on Sulawesi. So some of the examples, like sort of the classical examples of Sulawesi endemics uh, are shown here. This just gives me a chance to show you some nice pictures of some cool animals that I uh, generally don't study. So this is a Sulawesi red knob hornbill. This is a macaque monkey. There are seven or eight species of macaques that are endemic to Sulawesi. This is a Sulawesi warty pig. This is a tarsier, which is a small primate. There's a 10 to 16 species of these guys out there. This is an anoa, which is a dwarf buffalo. There are two species at least on Sulawesi. And this is a, a marsupial. This is the bear couscous, which comes in from the east. So it's one of the few lineages that we see on Sulawesi that comes from the eastern direction as opposed to from the western direction. And then the coolest endemic of them all, it's not a herb, I'm sad to say, is this guy, the Babi Rusa. And Babi Rusa in Bahasa, Indonesia, means pig deer. So the local people think that it looks kind of like a cross between a pig and a deer because these huge tusks that it have look sort of like antlers. Super awesome animal that's uh, a showcase endemic on Sulawesi. <coughs> 
So, you know, Alfred Russell Wallace and lots of the early people understood that Sulawesi had a lot of endemism, but they didn't really talk much about the in situ diversification that's happened on the island. Uh, but there has been extensive in situ diversification on Sulawesi. And some of the best studied examples are shown here. There are also examples from arthropods and such, but I picked some vertebrates. So we have our macaque monkeys, where there are seven or eight species. We have tarsiers, where there are approximately 10 species, maybe more. And we have these limnonectes fang frogs, which we're also studying, which include anywhere between 14 and 25 species, potentially more, bare minimum 14 uh, within that group. And I would say that the, the best studied system, uh, at least in terms of publications, remains the, the Sulawesi macaque system. Uh, work that was that started in the 1960s actually based on morphology and sort of culminated by Ben Evans with genetic data. Uh, the macaques are, the distribution of macaques is shown here. So there are seven or eight species, all of which are parapatrically distributed on Sulawesi. So each of these little areas here is the range of one of the species. So wherever you go you find one, you don't find two. So they have this jigsaw puzzle like distribution. <clears throat> And Ben was really interested in whether or not this pattern, which essentially was used to define areas of endemism on Sulawesi, whether or not uh, this would, would uh, is also manifest in other lineages that occur on Sulawesi. And so he did a study where he compared the Celebes toad to the monkeys. And using sort of, sort of basic genetic data, he argued that in fact, there, even though it's one species, there's genetic diversification on the island that more or less corresponds to the pattern that we see in the monkeys. But if you look closely, you'll see it's not an exact match. Right? So, but it's close. So it seems like the areas of endemism defined by monkeys and toads might be important. Of course, it's an open question why they're distributed the way they are on the island. This just shows you some of the monkeys so you can get a handle on or get a sense of the morphological diversity that occurs in the monkeys. Now, the tarsiers haven't really been very well studied, but I want to tell you just a little bit about them. Uh, because it serves my purpose. So, um, you know, the, from, from a phylogenetic standpoint and from a biogeographical standpoint, we don't know too much about them. Like, there's this 230 base pair mitochondrial data set that's been published. That's not much, and it's an unresolved uh, topology there. But there has been one really nice study done on a species contact zone, a hybrid zone, that happens in the central core of Sulawesi, in the northern part of the central core, along the Palu Koro Fault. And this guy Merker published a nice paper in PNAS showing that there's a hybrid zone that sits right on the fault. And they had multi-locus data, so they had microsats, and they had uh, a Y-link gene, and they had mitochondrial data, and they had vocalization data. And all those data pointed to a narrow hybrid zone that sits right there, suggesting that the faults on Sulawesi, and there are several, might actually be important from a diversification and speciation standpoint. Now, the, the frogs, I probably shouldn't have shown you the frogs, but I thought that since Jeff was going to be here, that I better at least show one picture of Linda Necky's fang frogs, because he's working on these for his dissertation. Uh, the frogs are really interesting. The, the, it's one of, one of the richest assemblages of vertebrates on Sulawesi. Um, there are, again, 14 to 25 species. They exhibit all kinds of body size variation and everything else. The problem is that you have all kinds of sympatry within this system. So we have a phylogeny for this group, but we have all these sympatric species. And in the central core, you can find at least six and potentially as many as 11 species in sympatry. And once you have sympatry relationships like that, it's pretty difficult to tease out the biogeography. And so they're not the best group for biogeography, but they're a really interesting group from the standpoint of potential adaptive radiation and the evolution of interesting reproductive modes and various other things that, that we're interested in. So I want to ask the question, are the areas of endemism that have been defined primarily with monkeys and toads, are these things a, a consistent feature of Sulawesi biogeography? And if so, is it possible to identify the general underlying mechanisms that have given rise to diversity uh, that has that sort of geographic orientation to it? And our approach has been one of comparative uh, biogeography. We've been studying all these groups. Uh, recently, we've developed much larger data sets for some of them. So we have exome capture data, like hot off the presses for Lamprolepis, and also for Cerdidactylus. We'll soon have, uh, we have a grant, so we'll soon have exome capture data for Lindonectes fang frogs. But today, I'm going to talk about just one of these groups, the flying lizards. And this is the group for which we have the best sampling, and I would argue the best data um, for assessing for testing this hypothesis with Sulawesi biogeography, or at least a set of hypotheses regarding Sulawesi biogeography. So, everything changed for me <laughs> uh, this year. So for a long time, we thought we had an idea what the tectonic history of Sulawesi was, and I used this idea to try to inform my biogeographical investigations of various tax on Sulawesi, including the, the flying lizards. Uh, we've known for a long time that Sulawesi is a composite island, and, that, and the fact that it's a composite island might have something to do with that para, set of parapatric distributions that we see with monkeys and, and with uh, toad genetic diversity. 
Uh, so it was once thought that Sulawesi was, is basically comprised of several paleo islands that originated from far-flung areas of Southeast Asia, and they came sliding in and began to, to collide at about 10 million years ago in a fairly complex process that resulted in this very bizarrely shaped, K-shaped island, right? Islands aren't supposed to look like that. Uh, and so I would often show this animation. I'm going to show it to you now just for kicks, which I'm going to tell you now is no longer accepted by the person who actually created it. <laughs> so here we see this. Uh, some parts of this are still relevant, but these are the different parts of Sulawesi that were thought to be sliding together. And you get this big rotation. This part of it's important where you see this slab rollback process happening because it actually has driven what's really been going on in Sulawesi. So as opposed to these slices of the island all sliding in and sort of ramming into Sulawesi, it looks like instead there was a single collision that happened with eastern terrains coming in and ramming into West Sulawesi. But since that time, the new model has the whole process being driven by this pullback process. So Sulawesi appears to have been extending, actually being pulled apart, as opposed to uplift due to subduction following these multiple collisions. And uh, so, so Robert Hall, the real expert on this, has developed a new set of models, uh, which I will show you in just a moment. And before I get there, this was something I showed, I think, the last time I spoke. So this was the model that I had been using. It was based on that tectonic, that dynamic tectonic model, where we had these different paleo islands sliding in. If you look at that, in, that reconstruction and the papers that underpin that reconstruction, they all basically show the fragments being bounded by, the, by faults on Sulawesi. So all these black lines are major faults on Sulawesi. They're real. I inferred that these represented essentially paleo islands that were once separated from one another and came together through this dynamic process. We no longer believe that that's the case. But I think the faults themselves are still potentially relevant, especially when you look at what's going on with the Tarsiers, where we see a species boundary in the hybrid zone sitting right on the Palucoro fault, which is up in here. So I don't want to give up on the faults as potentially being important for biogeography. But the distribution of land and sea is really different now but with this new model that Robert Hall has created. And I'm going to walk through this model really quickly, just showing you the slices, <laughs> the time slices that he's actually presented. And I can't, we can spend the whole day talking about them, and I obviously don't have all day. So, um, so I'm going to go through it pretty quickly, and then I'm going to try to give you sort of a boiled down version, sort of a framework that we can use based on the reconstructions that I'm about to show you. The main point is that Sulawesi has been relatively localized. The land areas of Sulawesi haven't really been moving. They've been all in sort of the same place for a very long time. The island starts off with these blobs of land. The closer you get to the present, the more sure Robert Hall is of the reconstruction. But essentially what we're going to be seeing is paleo islands forming in different places and then growing over time and eventually merging to form modern Sulawesi. So this is at 15 million years where it looks like there were two, two islands present. At 10 million years, there were three, so the Southwest Peninsula sort of comes online. At eight, at six, at five, at four, at three, starting to get these things amalgamating. At two, at one, almost everything is now connected, with the exception of the Southwest Peninsula. And then finally, at time zero, we get modern Sulawesi. So there are a few things about this model that are different than the, than the prior one, as I've indicated. You don't have these land areas sliding in from great distance. They seem to have originated sort of where they are now. Uh, but the other is that the islands also appear to be, the Paleo Islands merged relatively recently, more recently than was predicted based on that prior model. So now we see, you know, the, the Paleo Islands were in existence up until between four and one million years ago. Or, maybe, or potentially even less in the case of the Southwest Peninsula, which suggests that virtually anything that occurs on Sulawesi that's been there for more than three or four million years likely had the opportunity of colonizing Paleo Islands, diversifying there initially, and then following merger, right, forming secondary contacts and potentially interacting with closely related species. So this is a, a pretty unusual sort of uh, scenario. Because when we think about typical vicariance biogeography scenarios, it often involves a once unified land area that fragments over time, resulting in diversification, allopatry and diversification. But in this case, it looks like it was once a fragmented landscape, which potentially provided opportunities for colonization and diversification. And these things have since amalgamated, merged to form this single island, setting up opportunities for <coughs> secondary interactions between these relatively recently divergent lineages. So here's our map of Sulawesi, again with the faults. Now I'm superimposing onto this these boundaries, these breaks that might be important from a biogeographical standpoint based on the geological record, the model that I just showed you. And the basic um, you know, sort of syntax here is, you know, for example, at the Gorontalo Fault, at the beginning about 8 million years ago, there were land areas on either side of a barrier. And at about 1 million years ago, 
one million years ago, that barrier ceased to exist, allowing for a potential contact between, between these lineages. And you can see the same thing applying sort of all over the map here. So these are all potentially boundaries that could have given rise to diversification, yeah, diversification within lineages that occupied Sulawesi if they were there long enough. All right, so that's my big preamble. And, uh, and now we're going to talk a little bit about flying lizards. We'll start with a brief description of the system. So, you know, the group that I'm going to be talking about today, it's the Draco lineatus group. So these are, this is an assemblage, it's a monophyletic assemblage of nine species of flying lizards, currently recognized species of flying lizards, including three morpho species that occur on Sulawesi proper. I call them morpho species because they're morphologically diagnosable. I mean, I probably invented that term. Uh, this is Draco walkeri, this is Draco bakari, this is Draco spilinotus. Anybody who saw these animals would easily be able to distinguish them as separate species on the island. Then there are an additional six species, which are peripheral isolate species, that are on islands adjacent to Sulawesi, but that are part of this same monophyletic assemblage. And my, my plan for this group is to try to look at diversification within these flying lizards and ask whether or not the diversification patterns that we see are matching general features of the tectonic model that I showed you. That's what I'll talk about today. But I'm also interested in whether or not they show correlations with the areas of endemism that were defined by monkeys and toads, which, are, which have a lot of overlap but are not exactly the same. So here we have the distribution of flying lizards on, on, uh, on Sulawesi, the three species I just mentioned. Draco spilinotus is shown in orange here. It's on the northern peninsula, and then somewhat bizarrely, also on the west coast of the central core. Draco walkeri is found in the central core and also on the southwest peninsula. And Draco bakari here is shown on the eastern half of the island, so with these green dots. And at first blush, if you were looking at this map, you might think, well, there doesn't seem to be a strong correlation with the geological record that you just saw, except that there does seem to be a split right here, which we also saw with our model a moment ago. This are, these are the distributions of the other species of Draco that are also part of the lineatus complex. So we have three species of the Sawyer Tadog group of islands, which look very different than Draco spilinotus, uh, even though they occur adjacent to the northern peninsula. And then we have a species Draco supriatna in the Togians, Ritisma on Pelang Island, and lineatus occurring in the islands of Maluku, including these islands, so all the way out along this route. So the sort of the sequence that I've that I've um, that I've followed in addressing the biogeography of these flying lizards started with some basic Sanger sequencing, primarily of mitochondrial markers, but also uh, a few nuclear markers. So I generated a fairly large data set way back in the day when people still did this sort of thing, uh, where I had three mitochondrial genes and three relatively slowly evolving nuclear genes, so four loci, six genes, and I sequenced those for about 1,150 Dracos in total. Uh, but uh, for 523 Draco lineatus group samples. So I have relatively dense sampling across the island, which took me many, many years to, uh, to acquire, um, uh, which allows me to look at genetic structure within the group. And so the first thing I'm going to show you are some partition Bayesian phylogenetic analyses of the primarily mitochondrial 16 data set. And I'll just point out that this is not a time calibrated analysis. And this really just gives us a sense of where there's genetic variation associated with Sulawesi in these offshore islands. So if you boil down a great, big, uh, a great big tree into something a little bit easier to digest, it looks like this. And uh, there are a few points that I want to make about this tree. Uh, first of all, it's a very well-supported tree. Um, there are 18 well-supported genetic clades within this assemblage. So there are nine species, but 18 clades. Uh, and the reason why we have 18 and not nine is because each of the three species that's present on Sulawesi has its own deep genetic structure associated with it. So Draco walkeri here has five mitochondrial clay, primarily mitochondrial clades. Spilinotus has four, Bakari has three. And then the other thing that's immediately obvious to you is that none of these three species appears to be monophyletic relative to other species in the, uh, in the assemblage, which you can see here. So that's, a, that's an interesting outcome and one that demands further exploration. So we can walk through the tree just to show you how, the ge how it works geographically. Um, each of these mitochondrial clades that we were looking at is geographically coherent. So Draco walkeri can be divided into these five clades, which hopefully you can see there. Draco spilinotus can be divided into these four mitochondrial clades, which you can see here with different color coding. This map shows also their close relatives to spilinotus, as you can see on the tree there. And Draco bakari <coughs> can be divided into three mitochondrial clades. And in each case, as we see, according to the mitochondrial data, we don't really have a monophyletic assemblage. So some parts of Draco bakari seem to be more closely related to these peripheral isolate species off on these offshore islands than they are to other morphologically homogeneous 
Draco Bakari samples from the eastern half of Sulawesi. And if we take a look at this, um, that's sort of the whole tree with all of the different genetic clusters color coded. All these are all our sampling localities. And uh, one point that I want to make about this is that when I talk about genetic variation in this group, I'm not talking about like minimal genetic variation. I'm not talking about 2% mitochondrial breaks here. We're talking about really deep mitochondrial breaks within some of these lineages. So every break that I've shown you on the tree here, every mitochondrial break is at least 5.4% divergent and max out at 15.8% divergent. So this is a 15.8% uncorrected mitochondrial divergence between two populations of the same species, Draco walkery, which is pretty surprising. And you see breaks like that, 10.5%, you know, 15.6% between these guys. 7.7%, you see big breaks sort of all over the tree. So there's a lot of genetic structuring here that de demands explanation. <coughs> now if we take a look at where the genetic breaks occur and we ask again whether or not it's correlated with our, with our geological boundaries that are implied by the model that Robert Hall put together, there's a pretty tight correspondence. I mean, eight of these mitochondrial breaks that we see, these lineage breaks that we see, are sitting pretty much where you'd expect them to sit if the geological model that Robert Hall put together uh, is accepted. And I would say that this is actually a lot better than it looked when I was using the prior model with the, the, sliding, the sliding paleo islands. They didn't match as well as, uh, as Robert Hall's current model does. And of course, Robert Hall's model has nothing to do with flying lizards, right? So it just happens to be a fairly good correspondence between them. And I'll point out that there's an additional genetic break here. This is a 10.5% mitochondrial break that sits right on this low Anopa fault, which suggests that faults might also be important for flying lizards as they appear to be important for tarsiers. All right, well, so what time is it? Ooh, it's late. Um, so we could just, you know, sort of call it. Well, I guess I should make another point. So, um, so in it, although many of the genetic breaks are, are corresponding to, these, uh, to some sort of geological explanation, there are others that are not and that demand further exploration. And that's especially true for the central core, where we see all this genetic structuring going on, but nobody's ever proposed any sort of model that would seem to... to uh, to be correlated with the sorts of genetic breaks that we see in flying lizards. And maybe they're just unique to flying lizards, for all, you know, for all we know. But we see a whole bunch of breaks that, that don't really uh, have explanations yet and that we need to investigate further. So some obvious questions that arise from this part of the study is, how many species are we looking at here? I mean, we think we have nine species in the Draco lineatus group, but we have these species that are not monophyletic. They have all this deep genetic structure. Um, are these things cryptic species? Are there five species of Draco walkery? Are there four species of Draco spilinotus? Are there three species of Draco bakari? Uh, we, we also like to know something about the timing. This wasn't a time tree, so we don't really know how old these divergences are, but the, the amount of mitochondrial divergence is pretty great, which suggests that they're pretty old. And then, you know, just the basic question, <laughs> should we be worried that this is a mitochondrial result primarily? And I would say the answer to that is yes. <laughs> so, so what we've done in, uh, in recent years is try to expand on this data set by using you know, a, a more genomic approach. I actually did a sequinome study at some point, which I'm not even going to talk about today. That's already been, been it's already passe. It became passe when I did it, I think. But, uh, <laughs> but what I'm going to talk about today is an exome capture approach that we used for this system. So this is a targeted sequencing approach. It begins with transcriptome sequencing. And, and you're basically identifying exons that you can use as a, as a target. Then you build a MyBait. We used a MyBaits array to uh, capture array in order to do an in-solution capture and capture these target genes. And we had a, you know, we ended up screening, I think I indicated here, yeah, 313 individual Dracos representing all the species, but with some pretty dense sampling within this Draco lineatus group, more than 100 samples or Draco lineatus group samples, you know, plus some outgroups for 1,600 exons representing 709 loci that we identified from the transcriptomes, and then we added another 540 loci, which are UCEs that, were, uh, that are lizard-specific UCEs that Adam Lachey kindly made available to us. So we ended up screening a fair number of, uh, of loci for this, for this group of lizards. And our exome capture was very successful. We had like 200x coverage for the exome data and another, we had 60x coverage for the UCEs. You can look at the details here if you care about them, but the basic point is that we end up with 1,092 loci you know, which is a lot more than one mitochondrial locus, and uh, almost a million base pairs of sequence data, and, and, uh, and the markers themselves are quite variable. <coughs> so rather than talk about the phylogeny, I think the first thing I need to talk about is species delimitation. So I, I posited this idea that maybe these uh, mitochondrial lineages that we saw represent cryptic species, and I think that we need to investigate this further if we want to really make the argument that, in fact, they do represent independent lineages that other people or any people would would buy as actually being valid species. 
So I did uh, some species delimitation analyses using this exome capture data set. And I used a few different approaches initially to just get a handle on whether or not there was genetic structure there that you would expect in, in species. I did some structure analyses. I used a program called BFD Star, which is a species delimitation program. And I also used BPP version 3. There's a BPP version 4 now, which I've been fooling around with lately, but I don't have those analyses completed for today. But basically, BPP is this program that was developed by, by Zi Hung Yang and Bruce Ranala to try to use it in, the, in a coalescent framework, estimate species boundaries. Or, uh, or distinct lineages from within genetic data. Um, and this provides information about how many markers we had for each of these analyses, and we had a lot of data for the, for the analysis, suffice to say. So we can take a look at each of these groups and ask how many species are, infer are implied by, the, by this uh, exome capture data set. And what we see is that it looks like there might, be, there might be more than one species within each of these groups, but fewer than was indicated by the mitochondrial data. So in the case of, uh, of Draco walkeri, which is shown here, which are morphologically homogeneous, there were five mitochondrial clades. Now, when we did analyses with BF BFD star, it always finds the maximum number of species. I don't have any confidence at all in BFD star, but I'm still showing you the results. BPP also seems to overestimate the number of lineages, in my opinion. It, so these analyses indicated that there were five, you could identify five lineages within this assemblage. But if you look at a structure analysis, it suggests that there are three. And I think that if you don't see a lineage identified in the exome capture data set using a program like Structure, which ought to be pretty good at finding genetic variation within a group, that you're probably not talking about independent lineages. I have more confidence in the Structure results than I do in, in these results. Um, so what we find when we do a first pass with Structure with this data set is that there are two clusters. A cluster that involves these guys and a cluster that involves everybody else. And it looks like this. Right? Not a lot of gene flow happening between those lineages uh, in, you know, indicated in a, in a structure plot like that. Now if you take this set and you do a second structure analysis, you get two groups. You get this group and this group. And if you, do K, if you look at K equals 3, it looks like this. Which suggests actually, because these samples, basically it looks like these guys were once separated and have been merging. And, uh, and that there's fairly continuous gene flow across that, across that barrier. So I'm inferring that there are three species here according to this analysis. If you do a structure analysis here, <laughs> You, you don't get anything. There's no structure at all that's indicated in the, in the exome capture data set. Now remember that these guys are 15.6% mitochondrially divergent, and the, according to the nuclear data, there's nothing happening at all, which is kind of wild. Now the same thing happens with Draco Bakari. So with Draco Bakari, you know, we have these three mitochondrial clades, one of which sits on this La Wanopa fault and has a 10.5% mitochondrial break. When we look at our exome capture data, it looks like there's two groups this group and this group. And they correspond to a mitochondrial break, the smaller one, a 6.2% mitochondrial break. But the break across this 10%, 10.5% mitochondrial break, the, the, uh, the nuclear data says there's nothing happening here. And this is K equals 3 for this group. And there's like, it doesn't see anything at all going on across this, this, uh, this fault. So that's also pretty bizarre, right? The fact that you could have a 10.5% mitochondrial break and no evidence of any kind of nuclear structure and that the less divergent group is, in fact, apparently, a cryptic species, right? An independent lineage. And then we can look at the Draco Spilinotus as well, and I'll just sort of speed through this. It looks like, you know, we have two or four groups, depending on how you want to, you want to slice and dice Draco Spilinotus. So I didn't want to just stop with a structure type analysis. I think that when it comes to species delimitation and identifi identification of cryptic species, I think it's really important to think also about gene flow. Right? I mean, that's really where the rubber meets the road when we're talking about independent lineages. And so I wanted to, to uh, apply an approach that would allow me to estimate migration for this system as well. And whether or not there's really gene flow happening between these lineages that I'm identifying as putative cryptic species. So GVOX is a, a coalescent <coughs> population genetics program. It's built on the MCMC coal machinery. And kind of like IMA, for those of you who know IMA or IM, um, you know, it allows you to estimate theta and, est and estimate tau and estimate migration. And it gives you these values, these unscaled values, and if you know the mutation rate, you can convert those values to, to like real world values, like the effective population size, the timing of divergence, and the number of migrants per generation. And so um, I don't know the mutation rate for flying lizards, but for the GFOX analyses I'm going to show you in a moment, I use the mammalian rate. This one's thanks to Michael Nachman, um, which is uh, 2.2 times 10 to the negative ninth. Who knows if this rate is correct, but it at least gives us a sense of what the numbers might look like in the, in the context of a GFOX run. So this is what the GFOX results look like for the Draco-Walkery group. And what we see here is that 
there's a very deep divergence between these lineages, not surprisingly, and there's also a very deep divergence between these lineages, and there's very little migration happening between these lineages. And if you actually use the mammalian rate to try to make some estimates, you know, the timing of divergence appears to be 4.4 million years for these guys and 4 million years for these guys. And I think by, by any estimation, if those numbers are accurate, we're talking about different lineages here, right? We're talking about independent species. This part gives me pause. The effective population size estimates for these things are like sky high. And I don't know if that's simply the result of there being structure within these populations or if these numbers actually are reasonable, but those are really, really big effective population size estimates and have caused me to have all sorts of, uh, I don't want to say sleepless nights, but you know, the equivalent of a sleepless night, like po pondering the data and whether or not the data are really, are really legit. Uh, with the Draco Bakari group, we see that, I mean, there's no, GFOX finds no evidence of a break here. I don't show you the results because there are basically no results to show you. Uh, but there is a relatively deep split here. A, not as deep as the ones we were looking at in Draco Walkery. Looks like about 3.6 3 million years. Don't even look at the effective population sizes because they'll cause you to question my results. <laughs> Nobody wants to do that. And for Draco Spilinotus, it looks like there are four lineages, according to GFOX, all of which are fairly deeply divergent, right? So we see breaks, you know, on the order of 3.3 .3 to 4.2 million years between these, these various lineages, with a little more migration in this group than in the, the ones we were looking at previously. So GFOX results are largely congruent with the species delimitation analyses that I showed you. And for Draco Walkery, it suggests that there are three species, each of which diverged on the order of millions of years ago and are exhibiting uh, or experiencing limited, if any, gene flow. And you know, the relative timings of the divergences correspond to what we see with the mitochondrion in, in terms of relative times, not actual times that you would get if you tried to estimate it with 2% per million years or something like that. However, it also indicates that a relatively ancient divergence between the CC1 and CC2 population seems to have merged at some point and is still reflected in the mitochondrion for some reason. Draco spilinotus looks like it's two to four species, and Draco Bacari appears to be two species, again, with a merger that would have happened, a relatively old divergence that was followed by a merger uh, at some point afterwards. Um, with, uh, anyways, yeah, with that. So, you might be asking all sorts of questions at this point um, about my results and my conclusions. Uh, one might be, like, are these things really independent lineages? Do we have any confidence in that? You might also be asking yourself, well, okay, I buy that they're lineages, but are they really cryptic? You know, maybe they're not really cryptic lineages. How hard have you looked at the morphology? And so one of the things that we've done recently, this is with the help of, um, of my undergraduate, Denny, um, we've collected 23 mensural and meristic characters for 197 specimens representing the three Sulawesi species. And these are what the results look like. And if you've looked at PCA plots before, you know that there's nothing going on in these PCA plots. <laughs> and if you break it down to within species and you look at these genetic clusters that you know, within Bakari or within Walkery, they also look like this. And so it looks like from a morphology standpoint, there's really nothing going on. All these Dracos, from, a, from the standpoint of, of their shape and proportions, they're all about the same, which is what I would have actually, it's what I did predict before we even started this analysis. Because I can imagine that all these lineages are essentially just, you know, replaceable parts. You could go anywhere on Sulawesi and Draco Spilinotus would be happy there. And if you brought Draco Walkery and took Spilinotus away, Walkery would be happy there. And you only find one species anywhere you go within the range, so it suggests that they're all basically doing the same thing. They're ecological equivalents of one another. They're about the same size. They're about the same proportions. There's really nothing going on that would suggest that we're looking at non-cryptic species here. So I think there's pretty good evidence that they really are cryptic species. Um, I have also done some phylogenetic analyses, and I think in the interest of time, I'm just going to sort of blow past these phylogenetic analyses. We obviously need to know the sequence of divergences in, these, in this group in order to be able to make a more definitive estimate of the biogeography, and then apply something like BioGeoBears, you know, a, quantifi uh, a quantitative sort of analysis to those, uh, to those the phylogenetic results, I think, to really talk about the biogeography. And I haven't done the BioGeoBear stuff yet. I could talk, I could show you other things that are, that are relevant, but I think that I want to move past the phylogeny. This is the, well, maybe I'll show you. We've got 10 minutes. So, um, well, this is, this is a Raxamel and Astral, this is the Astral tree. And the Astral tree and Raxamel look very similar to one another. I did, so I've done three types of analyses here. I did Raxamel analyses of concatenated data, and those provide a sort of a first pass. You don't really want to concatenate a thousand loci. I mean, you're assuming that they all evolved into the same process, you know, into the same, <coughs> that they would all have essentially the same gene trees. Um, so you want to do something that actually, in the multi-species coalescent framework, that allows you to take in, into consideration variation in the gene trees that you would expect due to demography. 
And so the astral is a method that allows you to do that. So you, the input for astral are independent. You take the individual loci, you do a maximum, I've done a maximum likelihood analysis of each of the loci, and then you feed in those gene trees into astral, and it produces a multi-species coalescence summary tree. And that's what's here. And it looks just like the, the Raxamel tree, as it turns out. There are three nodes that differ. Each one is, is actually relatively poorly supported. The other thing that I've done is, which is much more labor intensive and frustrating, is, uh, is use Starbeast 2. So anybody in here done Starbeast analyses before? I see like four hands. How frustrated are you with Starbeast? <laughs> Stand up if you're frustrated with Starbeast. So I've run Starbeast analyses for years trying to get these data to work. I think I have an analysis that's almost done uh, with, with this one. It's still, it's still changing. I mean, this was the latest permutation this morning, but, you know, but the, you know, it's been running for a month and it's, you know, 500 million generations and it probably still has a long ways to go. It's not close to converging. But you can use Starbeast to do a full multi-species coalescent analysis and you can do it to estimate a dated time tree. And when you include the calibrations, that's when it gets really wonky and behaves poorly. So this is an example of a calibrated Starbeast time tree. It's for 100 loci. You can't do 1,092 loci in Starbeast, but you can actually do 100 locus subpartitions of a larger data set. And I'm doing that for five. I'm just showing you one of them here. The tree is also pretty much in agreement with the others. It suggests that the Draco lineatus group is about 4 million years old, but it turns out that this, this, the way that the analyses progress, it sort of settles on a node and starts to pull it apart, and that's happening now with this lineatus group. So I think it's going to come out a little bit further uh, to a date older than 4 million years, but 4 million years seems pretty young for the lineatus group relative to other divergence dating estimations I've done with uh, the old version of Starbeast with a 9 locus data set. Uh, but it's fairly in close... It's in pretty close approximation to what we see with the, uh, with the GFOX analyses, suggesting that somewhere in the order of four or five million years is the age of the common ancestor of this lineage group. All right. So tell you, I told you a little bit about the phylogeny. I, felt that, I guess I felt obligated to do so. So I want to come back to this issue of these deep mitochondrial breaks that are not supported by the nuclear data. And I ask you, we've been thinking about what might explain a pattern like that. And uh, this is work that's being done in collaboration with Alexander and with Cynthia, and Kay's involved in like everything that I do. He's the most important person in my life. Don't tell Sharon, my wife, I said that. <laughs> so we're really interested in trying to explain maintenance of these deep mitochondrial divergences, given that the nuclear data suggests that there's this continuous gene flow. And you know, when I talk to people about it, the first question is usually, is there sex bias dispersal? I think there probably is. But I still find it hard to believe that sex bias dispersal could explain these kinds of divergences lasting for this you know, time period, and why just in those places? And why would one of them sit right on a fault? I mean, that also seems uh, a little bit unexpected. So we've been pursuing this idea that it might be explained by mitonuclear to zansky muller incompatibilities. So we've been trying to, to uh, address this. And so most of you probably know what the zansky muller incompatibilities are. Essentially, you know, what, what happens with the zansky muller incompatibility is you have an initial lineage that diverges. Back at the, in, when, before divergence, we're looking at a couple of alleles here with little a, little a, little b, little b. They split into two populations. They begin to diverge. In this lineage, we get a new allele evolving, the big A allele. And in this lineage, the big B allele evolves. And when these things come into secondary contact, big A and big B are presented with one another for the first time. And they're incompatible. And, uh, and if they're mutually incompatible, you wind up with some sort of hybrid dysfunction. So that's an example of a, of a standard dzansky muller incompatibility. We might imagine that mitonuclear dzansky muller incompatibilities might be even more frequent than what we see than, than regular dzansky muller incompatibilities, just because one half of the equation here is the mitochondrion, which evolves really quickly. So you can imagine the mitochondrion accumulating nucleotide substitutions, including amino acid replacements, <coughs> that are relevant in isolation, following to some sort of divergence, potentially across something like the mm -hmm. Wawanopa fault. And, uh, and then the nuclear backdrop might actually occasionally have to evolve compensatory mutations to keep up with these changes that are happening in the mitochondrion. And then when these things come back into secondary contact, the mitochondrial genome in lineage A may no longer work well against the nuclear backdrop of lineage B and vice versa. So that's basically and fundamentally what we're interested in testing. So how do you test this? Yeah, so we decided that, the, that one approach would be to target genes that are likely to experience such a phenomenon such as genes in the OXFOS pathway, the oxygen phosphorylation pathway. These are genes that interact directly with the mitochondrial genes, with the genes that are encoded on the mitochondria. And they have to be compatible with one another in order to be functional. And of course, the function, their function is really important. 
Uh, so we identified the 60 gene or the 80 genes in the FOXPOS pathway, and then we identified another 520 genes or so, which are also either thought to be <laughs> like known to interact with the, with mitochondrial genes or potentially interact with mitochondrial genes. And we developed a new uh, MyBates uh, capture array for this set of genes, and then we went out and we did and we screened 28 Draco samples from this region and from this region with the idea of asking whether or not we see the same pattern in some of these nuclear genes that we see in the mitochondria. Started with Raxamel analyses of each locus and then we, and then our goal was to compare this to, um, to <laughs> the mitochondrial tree. So we have a Bakari ECC cluster and we have a Bakari Southeast cluster. We're asking whether the nuclear genes find monophyletic subsets of this. And uh, then, then Karen kindly provided the R script that allowed me to do this comparison. So how did it work? There were none. Uh, none zero. So I was, yeah, in a fit of rage, I, uh, I could search for both status faces so that they could match mine, and these were some of the ones that came up. I think your favorite. So we found none. There were no genes that showed the same pattern as the mitochondria, which was, you know, really sad and, uh, and a little bit frustrating. Now, another group of people have also investigated this question. So this, this group, Bar Yakov et al., published a paper in 2015, which essentially sort of beat me to the punch. This is something I've been thinking about for like 10 years, trying to test this sort of hypothesis. These guys went out and did it before I could. So they found in chameleons in Israel that sitting along a former marine barrier that, that closed about a million years ago, there's a 2% mitochondrial break. And when they were looking at microsat data, they didn't find any break in the, uh, according to the microsats there. So it was the same sort of phenomenon that we're seeing, but with a much smaller mitochondrial divergence. And they considered the possibility that this might also be driven by a mitonuclear incompatibility. And so they used a different approach. They did transcriptome sequencing of 10 individuals, five from north of the break and five from south of the break. And they identified like 230 genes that had an association of high SNP frequency differences across the, across the barrier that sorted with their five samples on either side. And out of those 230, they looked at go terms to narrow it down to 15 or so, I think it was 14, that were involved in interactions with, the, with mitochondrial genes. And then they did some Sanger sequencing to try to further investigate that and uh, with 70 individuals. So they upped their sample size and, and used these candidate genes and looked for a signature of uh, mitonuclear incompatibility. And they identified these six genes as being potentially involved. So they found that there were high frequency differences across the break. And they also did some structural modeling and argued that, uh, that at least in some cases, the amino acid replacements that were documented for the genes actually wouldn't work well with the mitochondrion, the mitochondrial sequence that was known from the, from the population. So that all sounded great. Um, none of the six genes that they looked at were fixed for amino acid replacements at, these <coughs> MT genetic, at the MT genetic boundary. And so this suggested to me that maybe my little, my little analysis here was a little too hopeful, right? Maybe a little too stringent. So we've done some follow-up analyses. I just got these data, Kay just developed, got these data yesterday. Um, so these are association test data where we asked basically for the same, we looked for the same pattern that the chameleon people found. And, uh, and we found that there is actually um, pretty reasonable evidence that there is a break occurring across the, the across this one, that there is a similar sort of association where we have high frequency differences across the mitochondrial break documented in these populations. Now we need to follow this up. We don't have any statistical tests. We don't know if you did a different group of individuals, if you'd see a similar number of high frequency uh, genetic differences, but, uh, but at least it looks promising that there are some genes that might actually be involved. And interestingly enough, the genes that we've targeted are all things that we've identified are all things that, well, seven of the top nine hits in the survey are oxfos genes, even though about 12% of the genes that we actually screened are oxfos genes, and 10 of the top 18. And these are all genes that definitely interact with the mitochondria. And so they're perfectly reasonable candidate genes. And interestingly enough, I, I did look, I did the same test. I did the modifyly test on the Draco Walkery assemblage, that other clade, where I have very, tip, very tiny sample size. And for the Walker ICC1 group, where I only have four individuals, there were 15 genes that were monophyletic in this group. Five of them had amino acid replacements. And among those five genes, three of them are the same genes that we're seeing in the Draco Bakari split which I think is also interesting, if not you know, definitive evidence that there's something cool going on. So obviously we have more work to do on that, but it seems like mitonuclear incompatibility might be a reasonable explanation for, for what we found. Uh, a very quick summary. Looks like Draco arrived on Sulawesi quite early. The, the, Sulu, the, the lineatus group, uh, bimaculatus split, dates to 17 million years on this tree. And it looks like bim uh, lineatus may have been sitting, the common ancestor may have been sitting on Sulawesi for 10 million years or so without really diverging. 
unless there is extinction, which there very well be, may be. And then they began to diverge about five million years ago. It looks like they colonized the Paleo Islands, diversified there, and then they've come into secondary contact as the Paleo Islands merged. And in many cases, the secondary contact has resulted in these parabolic <coughs> distributions. We have one hybrid zone. There's probably more hybrid zones than the one we've already found, which I didn't tell you about. And in other cases, it looks like secondary contact resulted in lineages merging. Right? They weren't divergent enough to, uh, to be maintained, and so they've, they've coalesced. And in a few cases, we can see a signature of that coalescence, apparently, because of something like mitonuclear incompatibility, because we still see these deep mitochondrial breaks there, despite the fact that the, the nuclear genome is telling us that there's continuous gene flow and that they're not cryptic lineages. So that's what I've got. Here's my acknowledgement slide, and I'm happy to take questions if people have them. How the history uh, it, early on it seemed like the the paleo um, islands yeah they, they were paleo that came back together but the high elevation habitats were newer it yes. seemed and so it looks like from what just piecing that together it seems like you'd expect from the the paleo the, the low elevation text to show the paleo island pattern but the high elevation text uh, unless they were just kind of leaking up into the high elevations they would, they might be expected to show a very different pattern from the, the low. I Is totally agree. Yeah, I mean, it's true. And I think that uh, we don't, the mountains are really young. I mean, according to Robert Hall's model, I mean, they're like a million years old, which is kind of crazy, right? Yeah. So all these things have uplifted relatively recently, and it would suggest that you wouldn't expect to see very many endemic lineages up there. Or if you did find endemic lineages up there, they would be lineages that were quite young. And I think that's basically what we're seeing. So the, the best example of endemism on the, on the high mountains of Sulawesi are in the rodents, in the murid rodents, uh, where we have these shrew rats and such, but I think they're all still pretty young, and I think they've just followed the mountains up. You know, so they were the early arrivals on Sulawesi, and I think these things have been replaced in the lowlands by more recent arrivals that are more typical rats, but the ones that are up there are very funky, like vermivores, the only, the only mammal without molars is one of these things, and so they're up there. But when you look at amphibians and reptiles, I mean, there's hardly anything up there at those high elevation sites. And so, you know, this oreophryne, which is, you know, predisposed to those high elevation habitats by being a direct developer, but it doesn't look like there's a lot of diversification that's happened at, the, at high elevation, at least in the lineages that I'm most familiar with. Yeah. Um, can you test those uh, those uh hypothesis about uh, the diversification, about the separation of, uh, of species? Uh, and especially since you have the hybrid zones, by taking actual actual lizards and testing whether there is some kind of incompatibility in the hybrids from different regions and try to make them? Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely possible, but it's pretty tricky with flying lizards. We've had lots of conversations about how nice it would be to have a flying lizard colony and to do those sorts of experiments, crossing experiments and things like that. But they're really, they're really, um, they're really difficult to keep in captivity. They're ant termite specialists. And so that part's challenging. But I think there are other kinds of experiments that can be done, like in vitro experiments, where you can still ask whether or not there's compatibility between the mitochondrion and another nuclear, well, maybe not. You can do that in copepods, like Ron Burton showed in his talk here you know, a few months ago. But I think there are some lab experiments that we could potentially do to follow up on it, to try to get a better assessment of whether or not there's really something going on with, with a mitonuclear interaction. But I don't know that we'll be able to do it in crossing experiments. Just can you because follow that in nature? They're mating in nature and their progeny? Well, that's the, actually, that's a great idea. So we know that there's a hybrid zone, and there's definitely back-crossed individuals in the hybrid zone. And so it would be possible to look at those individuals and try to make, and try to get, use those as a study subject. It's obviously a biased sample, though. Like, the ones that were incompatible, obviously, aren't going to be there for me to catch. But um, Do they have nests and things like that? They, they lay their eggs underground. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, why are you studying flying lizards? That's your next question. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do this in Prasadam. Yeah, they're pretty. That's true. Chuck? Um, the affected population sizes you've acknowledged or seem out of the ordinary. What are the affected population sizes for Benola's lizards on islands? Of I don't know. I'm looking at you, Ian. <laughs> I mean, look at somebody who studies Benola's. I would think they've been estimated. I don't know. I mean, there really aren't data sets like this for anoles. I mean, maybe there will be one soon where they can estimate the effective population size, right? I mean, you guys are doing that kind of work now. But I mean, it, the anoles phylogenies have been based on very few loci. 
I mean, there really haven't been these sorts of exome capture type or UCE based analyses. And so I don't think anybody has, has estimated these using a genetic tool. What Maybe about it's been done with. Or something like that? I don't know. I didn't do any investigating of what the typical effective population sizes are of lizards. But, you know, if the effective population size of Uda stansburyana is 150 and the effective population size of Draco macari is 37 million, I would ask some questions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> any other questions? Yeah, Alan? Um, thinking about the effective population size, if what you proposed is that two species are, like, really divergent, then you just have merged, I wonder if that could explain that the large effective population size because you basically potentially had almost species that have come back into contact and so you have there can be structure there that is influencing the result well no i mean the structure has gone away but the the if there was sort of like there was previously structured let genes diverge and now it's all mixing together and so you might have really high levels of diversity abnormally high because of that merger that might be true. I mean, it's possible that for Bakari, for example, that the estimate might be particularly elevated. But even in the Southwest Peninsula Walkery, which doesn't have any uh, signature of, of, kind of merger, they still have a really high effective population size. So I think all the estimates are really large. And I don't know if that's just you know, a problem with the analytical machinery or if it's real or you know, the markers that I'm using. I think they're high anyways, but they might be particularly high in the ones you'd expect them to be particularly high in, you know, given that logic. Any other questions? All right, well, thanks for coming. Appreciate it.